Hi, and welcome to Fire Engineering's Google Hangout with Steve Kerber of UL Labs. I'm Bobby Halton. I'm the editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering Magazine and the education director for FDIC. And today, it's a great pleasure to be hanging out with my good friend Steve Kerber. Steve and I have been kicking around for the last 15 years together trying to make sense of what we do for a living. But before we begin, we just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor and our, our show, FDIC, which is 14 weeks away now. It's going to be April 7th in Indianapolis. You can still register. There are still spaces left in the hot classes, although a couple have sold out already. Jim McCormick's is sold out, and the Live Fire is sold out, and um, I think Aaron Fields is getting close, uh, the nozzle forward. So uh, make sure that you uh, go to FDIC.com, get registered today. We're expecting another 30,000, 35,000 firefighters this year, so hang out with 30,000 of your closest friends. Steve will be presenting some new updates from the UL uh, studies that Steve is the director of, and uh, you know you certainly want to catch that information. A lot of new stuff happening. There's going to be a comedy night. I didn't have a chance to tell you about this, Steve, but the uh, Firefighter Cancer Support Network, which is very important to me, is going to be doing a comedy night on Tuesday night. So the entertainment now starts on Tuesday night. So right after we get done with the hot, and I think it's 7.30 at night at the Indiana uh, Ballroom, uh, they're going to have a real professional comedians from all around the country. And uh, it's a fundraiser for the Firefighter Cancer, Cancer Support Network. So please come support that. You can get your tickets online if you go to FDIC.com. There should be a link up there. If there's not, I'll, I'll talk with our folks and we'll get a link up there. But if you go to the Firefighter Cancer Support Network page, I'm sure they have a link up there. But we'll, we'll link to it uh, as soon as possible. And um, please, please support crowd. that. That's a really tough crowd. Yeah, Canadians uh, and a bunch of, bunch of firemen. Yeah, right. And, and right after you know two days of hands-on training and the workshops, <laughs> they better be good. They better be good. You know, you figure Chief Bernasini is going to be in the crowd. So <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're not funny, that'll be pretty apparent pretty quick. So uh, what what they're what they're in store for. So please uh, join us at FDIC this year. And if there's anything that uh, we can do for you at Fire Engineering or anything that uh, that it comes your way and you need to get a hold of me, you can reach me at Robert H at Penwell.com or, or call my cell. It's 201-406-8278. I'll answer and if I can help you, I'll help you. But please uh, don't hesitate to call on me anytime. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Steve. Steve, thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure, Robbie. If you want to send us a question, what you got to do is um, send a, uh, a text message with hashtag Bobby Chat and tweet. I'm sorry, tweet us at hashtag Bobby Chat, and uh, that'll get your question right to us, and we'll answer your question online. So if you have a question for Steve about what the UL testing is doing, uh, concerns you may have, rumors you heard, um, you know, anything, any question at all about fire behavior, tactics, uh, you know, what's going on, the Spartanburg studies. I know Steve and Dan uh, went down there and working with Shane and the, and the good folks down there in South Carolina. Um, anything that's on your mind about fire behavior, this is the guy. So we've got an hour of Steve's time. He's been gracious enough to join us. So please, hashtag, send us a tweet at hashtag Bobby Chat. So put your question in 140 characters and, and get it to us. So Steve, t just a little bit of your background and, and where you grew up and how you got sure. into fire science. Well, grew, grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. and. Um, uh, third generation firefighters. So I've known the, the firefighting my entire life. Grew up in uh, a suburb in southwest uh, Philly called Broomall. And uh, you and Dennis Miller. <laughs> and uh, had the uh, great opportunity to, to grow up with a grandfather who was chief of the department for 27 years. And uh, my dad was actively involved. All my uncles were actively involved. So it was, it was a family thing just like uh, a lot of people in the Northeast. They must be pretty proud now, huh? Well, it's it's fun to. Um, Is Grandpa watch. and Dad still around, or it's still uh, around? Grandpa passed, okay. uh, but yeah, Dad's uh, Dad's also running a fire training academy, the Delaware County Emergency Services Training Center, right outside of Philadelphia. Oh wow! So, uh, well, Chief Kerber, thank you, thank <laughs> you for thank you for producing this guy. What a, what a blessing to the fire service. That's we we get to go back there all the time, and we try and burn some stuff out there, and. and Try and go back home and, and do some stuff around the, the old stopping grounds. And uh, I got a, a. So, do you get into heated arguments with your dad about uh, fire behavior? And, uh, every, every now and then. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, 
Has he accused you of being a heretic yet? Well, he, well, he gets to. I mean, he keeps me uh, grounded with what today's firefighter one class is like. Uh, yeah. What I mean, I, those are the those are the guys that are really doing it when it comes to training. I mean, oh, the yeah. guys that are running these academies day in day out, scheduling the instructors that all have other jobs. I did it for uh, four years. I know it's, it's, it's brutal. It is. It is. Our, our good friend Eric Roden is up in Milwaukee yeah. doing it right now. Absolutely. Our, my, our hats off to everybody out there running a fire academy. It is specifically if you have a question, hashtag Bobby Chat at the academy about what you should be doing or differently or. We got Steve right here right now, and uh, you know, we'll be happy to answer your questions. So, so please, you know, hashtag Bobby Chat and let us know what your questions are. So, Dad's running the fire academy. Dad's running the fire academy. Uh, you joined the firehouse is uh, the day I turned 16, and uh, got to ride on the trucks and um, went to recruit school. At my dad's academy, which was a little awkward, but uh, got through that with a uh, with a good friend of mine who your son knows. Uh, that's absolutely Tom right. Murray and uh, brother, brother. Yeah, that's his call sign. With drama, with drama. Yeah, my, yeah absolutely. Just so everybody knows what we're talking about, the, Steve's best friend is best friends with my son, and they're both naval aviators out at North Island. And uh, my son's call name is is drama, and uh, Steve's friend's call name is brother. And the reason they call him brother, it's very interesting. It's because he, every now and then, call names are an interesting thing. Uh, my son's comes from some movie that all the kids know where there's a guy named Drama. But brother was given to Tom because they really consider, every guy who's ever flown with him, every man who's ever served with him, considers him a brother. They, they, he's that, he's that yeah, kind of guy. Uh, he is that kind of guy. And, uh, yeah, and so small his, world. his dad was chief. My dad was president. We turned 16 about the same time, and we went through training together. And both of us have been crawling around the fire truck since we were two years old. So it was uh, it was fun to, to go through his, that. And his life took a horribly bad turn, and he joined the Navy. I'll tell you <laughs> what. I, I envy the hell out of him. That's for sure. Flying those uh, those badass helicopters, but. Uh, so he's he's doing that and um, get, getting blurry. Did we uh, did we just blur on you guys? I'm sorry, we're having a little camera issue here, but we'll we'll see if it'll come back to us. Looks fine. Our technical okay. people said technical looks fine, people so. say we're good. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, graduated high school, and uh, in high school I was pretty good at math and science, and had to make a choice of what what the hell do you want to do when you grow up, and was lucky to find the uh, University of Maryland. The fire protection engineering program, and uh, the only undergrad program in the country. And the cool part of that was that uh, all the fire stations around there have live-in programs. Great. And, uh, I happened to to be lucky enough, and again, it's through connections of uh, one of the kids that was living in the firehouse at the time went through my dad's academy, and I was able to uh, to weasel my way in. Normally, I was so I was a freshman living with a bunch of juniors and seniors in in the program. That had to be interesting. And, uh, it was interesting, and uh, but it's—I mean—it's an incredible learning experience. You, you go to school during the day, you learn your your theory and your math and science and all that stuff, and all the uh, fire protection subjects, and then nights and weekends you're covering the firehouse. So pretty much seven. We had career folks from seven to three. Uh, part of Prince George's County, Maryland. So this is the, the College Park Volunteer Fire Department. We're one of 47 stations in the Prince George's County. Um, about, I think it's about 1,200 volunteers, 800 career folks. And uh, the career folks would cover the station from 7 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. And then the volunteers, volunteers. would cover it, uh, the other three shifts, essentially. Wow. And uh, we lived in the bunk room above the firehouse. And, and there's a lot of colleges that do that. So you know, if you have an opportunity to do that, there's not a better learning experience. Even Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah sure. Notre Dame has a has a great program. So there's, uh, I mean, Prince George's County, especially around the University of Maryland, is is full of these programs: College Park, Hyattsville, right. Berwyn Heights, uh, Ranchville. There's there's a whole bunch of them in Bladensburg that uh, essentially have these devoted volunteers that are are running a fairly urban system. And uh, so went through that system, uh, couldn't get enough of it, so I uh, lived there as long as I could, got my undergrad and my master's degree from Maryland, and uh, moved out of the firehouse and got a job at NIST, National right. Institute of Standards and Technology, yeah. 
That's where I first met you. Yep, and uh, you were the new guy. So I was the, the new guy there. So I was working uh, at Maryland Fire Rescue Institute, uh, working with the good folks there. And uh, NIST happened to come, and they were doing a kind of like a industrial fire brigade class where they were, okay, here's a bunch of scientists that are doing firefighter research. Let's take them down to the academy for the day. And um, I happened to be working that day, and they wanted a ladder truck to climb. So I ran up to the fire station, grabbed the ladder truck, brought it down, and met Nelson and Dan and, and Randy and Doug and all the guys at NIST. And it's like, what do you mean you guys are the firefighting technology group? What the hell's that? Right, right. And, uh, What's NIST? Exactly. What the heck is NIST? And uh, from there, I got a co-op. So I started as a, as a student, as a junior in undergrad, and uh, wound up working there all the way through grad school and got hired. Uh, when I graduated, and uh, was at NIST for eight years, and uh, we had some fun when you were at NIST. We did, yeah. yeah we uh, had some fun. A lot of positive pressure stuff, high rise high buildings, buildings, burning down schools. T uh, Toledo, Toledo, Governor's Island, Brown Island, Island. Island. Brown one. Uh, yeah. Burned a lot of buildings, yeah. and uh, learned a lot along the way. And uh, we learned a lot about how to protect the instrumentation too. Yeah, and in the yeah. early days, that, that was one of our big uh, weak spots. Was that we, we were weren't good at protecting our own equipment, or turning thermal imaging cameras oh. into charcoal briquettes because when oh. you blew flames over them, is uh, oh, there's a learning experience. It's going to cost a little bit of money. It had, it, it had been the famous uh, Chicago story with, oh, well, you're fine here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Run for your lives. <laughs> That doesn't happen. It's all very controlled. <laughs> it's all very predictable. Uh, so, yeah. so then UL picked you up about six years ago now, right? Uh, just hit five years. Just hit five. Okay. Just hit five years. So they. Uh, and, and a big shout out to Chris Hasbrook, who really you talk about guys of vision, and a lot of people don't know that name in the fire service, but UL Laboratories, Chris Hasbrook, Pravin Gandhi, and and that team, um, you know. And which Steve is a huge part of, and uh, without Chris's vision and UL's generosity and, and support, you know, a lot of what we're learning today just wouldn't be out there. And um, I remember, you know, when we first, you, I first run into, I first met Chris, we were out at, and we were in the Chicago. We were doing the uh, yeah, we were doing the uh, Robert Taylor project. Robert Taylor burns. project burns, and uh, we 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 went buffing. I took him buffing. Yep. He had never gone buffing before, so we went buffing. And you we, created a monster. And, yeah, and we run into did. Roy, Roy Orozco. Roy, the chief of department was running a job, yep. and he brought the MVU. Yep. We took it to that, uh, that um, uh, it was like a one-story... Uh, like a warehouse loading yeah, dock. Yeah, warehouse right loading dock yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, and we threw, we fired up the MVU, and we yep. you know, went in. We and went and, from the experiment to the fire scene to go below the building. Exactly up. right. I remember and, that. Yeah. Chris says, this is really cool. I said, yeah, this is called buffing. This is what we do. Yeah. You know, he shows up at fire stations every day now because of that. Exactly right. You know, and, and what a great guy. I mean, what a, absolutely one of my favorite people in the whole world. So, yeah, so. all right. So we promised you that... Uh, We'd answer your questions, so now we know a little bit about Steve and, and what he does. So we got the first question, and it comes to us from the front seat. Oh, great. This is The front seat are a bunch of great friends of ours. Thank you so much. Huge supporters of fire engineering. So what's the question? Somebody wants this to be an all-in-one answer to the fire service, like a silver bullet. Um, and how should the research be applied? Well, let, let, let's let's get into that a little. And, and while we start at the beginning, and I think that you know, sure. um, if, we, if we you know, let's talk about uh, let's just let's, let's start with the basement fires, or for lack of a you know, fairly straightforward studies there. It, you want to take it? Well, I think the big piece there is that. Everything we've done from the beginning is trying to to gain more knowledge about how fire grows and spreads, how our tactics uh, work with that fire growth and spread, different scenarios, basements, horizontal, vertical, um, and it's it's all about showing that there is no silver bullet. It's it's all about taking um, instead of being completely robot driven. Um, getting blurry. Yeah. 
instead of being completely robot driven is always do this, always do the same thing. Um, we need to get into a situation where it's uh, we've got thinking firefighters. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So, and I think when we talk about the the application, Steve is exactly right. We're, the applications and the information that comes out of it, and to kind of paraphrase what Steve just put out there, is that it's not a silver bullet. It's information, it, and, and it, it's to help you make decisions on the fire ground that. that that can keep you safer, and we don't know why we're getting our cameras getting blurry on us here. There so goes. there, we're back. I apologize for that. But in terms of a silver bullet, it's not a silver bullet. I don't, I don't think anything you put out there at, at this point. It's, you're just telling firefighters, sometimes confirming what we've known. Most for, of the time, confirming. Absolutely. Most of the time, confirming what we've thought or what we've known for generations. Stephen and I were were laughing in the uh, the other day about a quote that a good friend of ours, Eric Roden, sent to us. From James Braidwood from 1866, where he, and he was to the London Fire Establishment, and he talks about air tracks. He talks about up, up upon recognition of a fire in a building, all doors and windows should be kept shut. Duh. <laughs> and, and he was talking about controlling the ventilation. So you know, Google James Braidwood, look, pull up the quote, and you can see that we're not we're not uh, trying to reinvent the wheel here, and 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 clearly. What's important to, I think, Stephen and to Dan and to all the other people who are really leading this research is they want, they want your questions so that they can try to find out that, and get you good answers, if that makes sense yeah, in the process. We're, we're not doing any of this for us. I mean, yeah. I, I like to think that, I mean, firefighting is the best profession in the world. And uh, even though we can't make the camera not be blurry, but... Is it, is it getting clearer for you guys? Because we're, we're seeing a blurry. We apologize again. I don't know why this camera is giving us such a hard time, but I mean, because I don't know if we're too close or what. But the fire service needs needs support because it forever we've been 100% experience based. No other profession in the world learns by doing on the fly all the time. So we've got the ability to essentially work for not one department, work for the 35,000 fire departments out there in this country and try and get some answers so they can do what they need to do more efficiently, faster, safer, all of that. Well, and I think that, you know, like just, again, I like, the, you know, I like to start to be, I'm a simple man, so we start at the beginning. When we talk about there's no silver bullets, we did the basement studies, and, and those studies really started off looking at the collapse potential of the floor above, sure. which has killed many, many firefighters. I mean, you know, um, uh, a, a bruzo, um, uh, Robin Boxerman, Firefighter Shara, you know, they fell through floors into basement fires. And so the, a lot of what came out of it, which I thought was fascinating, wasn't just the, the issue of the fire behavior within the basement, which was important in the collapse potential, but the thermal imaging information that came out of it. A lot of people had gross misconceptions about the capabilities and limitations of thermal imagers and, and the whole idea between relative and absolute temperature differences. Which was a great thing to illustrate. Sure. So I think I think there's some unintended consequences, but in terms of you know to answer to get back to jump seats, uh, front seats uh, uh, question and thank you for that. These aren't silver bullets. These aren't no one from UL or NIST or, or fire engineering or or Spartanburg or anybody else is saying this is how you have to do something all the time. What they are saying is that given certain conditions and given certain environments. It's fairly um, predictable that this could be what you're going to encounter, and here are some options. Absolutely. You know, I mean, we, we can't test every possible configuration in every type of building everywhere. However, if we can understand the effects of geometry, we can understand the effects of the fuel load, you can start making very good decisions based on what you see at 3 o'clock in the morning in the street. And, uh, I mean, the, the fire behavior, as we begin to know more about it, temperatures, pressures, things like that, things that we can measure today that we couldn't measure in the past. Um, I mean, that's the other big thing. It's not, not only the fire environment's changing on us, and a lot of the things with the fire service are changing. Uh, 30 years ago, we could make eight measurements on a strip chart recorder of something on fire, and it would be hard to do in the field. Now we can make hundreds of measurements, temperature, pressure, gas concentrations, so we can start seeing things that we could never see before. So 
instead of you crawling around blindly in a, in a structure and gauging whether or not things get better, or whether a tactic works solely on did the fire go out or not, it's now, oh, so that's what's happening on the other side of the nozzle. That's what's happening when I open and close the door. Because your actions on one end of the structure have impacts on the other end of the structure. We can measure that stuff now so we can learn more. And I think that that's it's, it's great. Well, and, and the, the, specifically to the basement test, you took the different assemblies and looked at the collapse times. Yep. And, you know, when you talked about the wood I-beams, the engineered, uh, you know, components, six to eight minutes? Yeah. It's, I mean, we went from from 20 minutes down to six minutes or so. Yeah. Which, which is interesting because in the car last night we had the discussion, where did the 20-minute rule come from? Sure. I, I really don't know. Probably should. But anecdotally, I think it probably just came from people's experience base sure. over the years that buildings after 20 minutes probably became, you know, much less tenable. Much, you know, their their, their support structures became yeah. imp imp impeded. So I think that we had mass. We had it took that took that long to burn through the mass. Right now we have geometry. Now we have geometry, and, and it's a different it's a we different math. ball game. Yeah, we have math, and 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 we also have products that are accelerating the fire's effects on that geometry. I mean, it's not just the geometry. It, it's the, the carpet's burning now, the padding's burning now, and, and that's all added fuel load that, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, we didn't have. And, uh, you know, I always love it. And the people, if you, if you really want to know how involved UL has been with the fire service, you know, give me a call sometime because I, I was trying to find out early work on plastics and fuel loading. Um, uh, J. D. L. Brittling, UL Labs, presenting at FDIC, Pretty Plastics, Ugly Fires, 1951. And, and so this organization, UL and this, that have been studying fire and fire products and, and, and uh, fire behavior with different products you know, for generations and, and really learning a lot. But if we just stick with the with the, uh, the basement deal and front seat's question about silver bullets, no one's saying not to enter the house if you have a basement fire. No one's saying you can't still make entry into a basement. But there are other options now, you know. And and it was great because after we after the basement studies came out, you know, I, people I would and I, I get I get to go out once in a while and, and visit with firefighters. The the you know more and more people were asking me about. You know, we, we pulled out our old Breslin distributor, or we grabbed our cellar nozzle. You know, and and, and now we're really, you know, we're not we're not going to go down that stairwell anymore. Compound that with what you started to do with, you know, air drafts and flow paths, and yeah, no, it's I mean, it, it's all very explainable. And uh, I mean, you're either going to fall through a basement and die, or you're going to get caught in flow path between where the fire is and where the fire wants to go. We can understand those two things pretty well. We can know. When do you take the stairs? When do you fight the fire on the level that it's on? Do you put water in the window? What's the best way to put water in the window? Do you take go in the walkout? How long does it take to get a line to the Charlie side? How long does it take to protect the stairs? What happens when you protect the stairs? I mean, we can we can study all these things, and we have. And and Governor's Island, the last go around, we did a ton of stuff on basement fires, looking at the flow paths and things like that. And some of it's counterintuitive. I mean, you, you get a fire in the basement. The initial thought is, well, I'm going to take the windows in the basement because that's going to let the fire out. Right. And if I let the fire out, releasing, it's not going to go up. The, the, old, the old idea of releasing the heat and energy. Absolutely. Which is actually accomplishes the opposite. Because there's so much energy. So much energy. That it's got nowhere to go. You can't give it enough holes to go out. The, pet, the path it wants to go is straight up the chimney, which is straight up the stairwell. And so it's the biggest hole. It's the biggest hole. So if, if you've got that front door open, which you have to if you're going to make access to the first floor, you now create a low pressure at that front door. The moment that you vent that basement, you just essentially let your finger off the other end of the straw, and it's going right up and out through that front door. Which And, it, and it's, that's a great lead-in because Steve and I were just talking about this. You know, it, 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 it's interesting how our minds work. I was having a conversation with John Bernasini. And we were talking about flow paths and controlling the door and how controlling the door, there was always a door person in your evolution. You know, and, and when we grew up, when we were kids. It's a big pinch point. Yeah, it's a huge pinch point. And it's also a feed issue. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a huge uh, maneuverability issue. So 
I said to John, I said, you know, I'm going to foresee the day when somebody's going to invent a tool where we'll just punch a hole out of the door so we can keep it closed but still feed hose without having it out of the door open. And Steve said to me, yeah, folks in Clark County were cutting the corner of the door off. Clark County is cutting the corner of the door and feeding hose. Brilliant. Yeah. Outstanding. Control the door. Control, yeah. control the airflow. Yeah. And, and that's the, so we'll show you what happens when you do do that. Yeah. But how to do it. Fire service has been phenomenal at coming up with the how. For I, I guarantee. Years. I guarantee you, there's some firefighter right now in his basement making a drill bit that's going to punch a <laughs> hole that's you know three and a half or four inches wide. Sure. That you can just walk up and go. Whoop. Well, and the big deal is you don't have to. You don't have to completely close the door to get the no. get the positive. But the you but, close it halfway, it yeah. has a huge impact on how the fire grows and spreads. So if we when we understand why, you can start fitting it into your operations. Outstanding. Well, we're going to take another question here, but first I want to ask our technical people, is the video okay? Because we're seeing a blurred screen. Nick, or it's kind of coming in and out, so we apologize for that. If it's blurring up on you, we'll try to make it work. Stephen and I have to come all the way in and mess with the camera, <laughs> make it work. Um, that seems to work, though, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Stick your face in there. You know what that reminds me of? Second City TV, where the guy used to go, ooh, scary <laughs> stuff. Remember that? Yeah. Um, so our second question is? Ah, okay. So Pete, thank you Pete for sending in this question, but Pete asks, what's next for UL and how do you decide what you're going to do next? Sure. Uh, well, we got two projects going right now. We've got the exterior fire spread and attic fire project, which we're getting towards the end of. Uh, we've got the positive pressure project, which we just kicked off uh, at the end of last year, and we'll be doing the testing at the end of this year. And uh, a plug for the assistance to firefighter grant program. I mean, not a lot of people know that they're. Everybody knows that's where you go to get your equipment and your and your training and things like that. Um, of the money that's available through AFG, uh, a small percentage of it goes to fire prevention and safety. Right. Of that fire prevention and safety money, a small portion goes to research. And that's where we've been fortunate, where we've been able to apply, put some proposals in, and, and get funding through that. Um, that's getting ready to open up again. So the question's very timely. Um, so what we're what we're planning on proposing is trying to answer a lot of the questions that have come up as we start talking about hitting the fire from the outside, transitional attack, and things like that. There's a lot of questions that remain about steam, impact of uh, fire conditions on civilians as well as firefighters. Uh, a lot of questions that have come up. Doc, Doc Brown and uh, Doc Smith are also going to be working on uh, in conjunction with what. UL and NIST are working on. Right. They're looking at the physiological responses that we have within our gear as these environmental conditions change. And Absolutely. so we need the data. It, it's not one to one. It's not, well, either I put water from here or I put water from here. Well, no, it takes a certain amount of time to get here and it takes a certain amount of time to get there. And conditions aren't staying the same. Right. So we need to understand the timing issues and things like that. Um, the differences between uh, are you in a flow path, are you not in a flow path, is it an interior attack, exterior attack, we hope to look at all of that. Um, everything down to partnering with the University of Illinois and, and Gavin Horn and Denise Smith and, and the folks there looking at um, pig carcasses, uh, respiratory tracts of mice. And pig carcasses uh, is not in any way a reflection on firefighter physiology. It's yeah. just an animal that most closely it's, resembles it's skin. You know what skin. happens to your skin. Exactly right. Because and, uh, and, we, can't, we can't put firefighters in there and say, all right, we're going to see whether or not you're going to get steamed or not. Right. You, you may or may not get second degree burns. We, we can't do that. So we need to come up with, with measurements as well as uh, different techniques to try and get the answers that the fire service is asking for. Um, and how do we come up with that? Well, a, a couple means. Um, one, we pay attention to all the feedback we get. If I'm presenting somewhere, that's a question that comes up. Uh, on our Facebook page, that's a question that comes up. On our blog, ulfirefightersafety.com, people are asking those questions. And ultimately, uh, we have an advisory board that's made up of uh, about 20 firefighters, fire chiefs from across the country. And we solicit them for topics. What, what do you want to know? What, what 
what answers do we need to try and provide so that you and can do all, your job better? Well, all of those people are active street people, so absolutely, it's, it's not you know guys like me don't qualify because I'm not on the street. You know, yep. I, I get to hang out and play, but at a different level. But when Steve talks about this advisory group, it's critical that people understand it's always changing and it's always people who are actively involved in, in real firefighting. And, and so it's a it's a very credible group and it's a large it's departments, small group. departments, career volunteers, career about wildland, the whole gamut. It's it's not easy. I mean we've got one point one million firefighters, uh, well, we've got thirty five thousand fire departments Firefighting is very local, as you like to point out over and over again. Um, but the fire doesn't know if it's in Ohio or Alabama or New York. It's, 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 lo it's local in our resources. Yes. It's, it's behavior is universal. Absolutely. And, and that's the difference. Fire behavior is universal. Yep. Our responses to it are local. And, and it's always going to be that way. And that's, by, I think it's, I think it's uh, our strength. Actually, sure. um, you know, folks in, in uh, areas that are very rural better understand grain bin silos, dust explosions. They better understand farm implementations, equipment, things of that nature. And then folks that are out in the you know more urban environment, they they better be extremely well versed in things like you know uh, scuttles and stairwells and and below grade operations. Sure. Uh, and it's not to elevate the latter or denigrate the former. They're both absolutely critically important parts of the puzzle for that community. And, and that's what firefight, you know, just a quick segue, you know, the other day I, I saw a comment on a Twitter feed and it said, uh, career and volunteer fire departments, the public doesn't know the difference, but we do. And uh, I was going to beg to differ. Uh, I know many volunteer fire departments that could go up against any career department and no one could tell the difference. And, and uh, you know the professionalism across the board in the United States Fire Service today is unparalleled, Absolutely. And, and it continues to elevate no, no small part due to your efforts and, and uh, you know Dan and, and all the other it's Nelson and Power and all the other good folks, Mike and all the other guys and gals that that, that are contributing and, and the people on the boards. But let's tackle this. Do we have more questions waiting? Before we do, we're going to go to our next question. I, I want to tackle for a section, a, a, a second, if you'll indulge me, the steam question. What do we know at this point, and and what you know? We've talked a little bit about what we want to learn: the steam effects and physiology, and the and, and the travel, and the and how it affects the you know, and how it moves. What 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 do we know, and and what do you want to find out? Because the the big question becomes. Transitional attack. Let's you know, it's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Sure. So we're 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 making a we 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 find a fire, and I'm just going to build a quick scenario for you. Everybody has it, and let's say it's a for lack of a, you know, let's not get over elaborate, but it's a it's a, a larger ranch style, maybe 2,300 square foot. We got a fire that looks like it's predominantly in the kitchen, maybe some extension into a dining room, but a fairly interior fire. Limited resources, whatever. We roll up first do engine. We've got three people. We decide we're going to do a quick transitional to get a knockdown on it. Fires, you know, we, we, we know the fire location, so, so we decide to do that. The, the, the debate becomes, if there are firefighters advancing another line, say through the A side door or whatever, are they going to get beat up by the steam production? And if there are potential victims, are we in fact creating an environment that's now non-tenable for them unless they're in a, you know, an isolated location? And that, that's the, the crux of the matter. Yeah, well, I mean, even if you don't have firefighters advancing in against that first line, you could potentially have occupants that need rescuing anywhere Absolutely. in that structure. Absolutely. And uh, I think a lot of what, we've, what we have learned is that applying water to the seat of the fire very quickly has very good results. It lowers the temperature. It drops the temperature like crazy. Um, and then there are those big group of firefighters of which I've experienced myself where a line comes in from somewhere it might be an interior attack and uh, you, steam gets produced and you get steam put over top of you and it becomes uncomfortable and the question is well why and what does that mean and what about the victims what about Mrs. Smith that we're going to rescue or making things better or worse and uh, 
we're, we're putting a lot of the pieces together, a lot of it has to do with the flow path and pressures. You're going to do an interior attack. You go ahead, you go through the front door, you start making your way to that kitchen fire. You're going to open up your line on that kitchen fire. So one of the first questions is, is flowing water flowing water? I mean, we, we've all heard things like, well, if you rotate your nozzle clockwise versus counterclockwise versus upside down use versus spell your name, I mean, all, all of these things, the bottom line is we're, that's funny. we're, we're used to being on the, the, the business side of that nozzle. We're behind right. that nozzle. And that's so all we we're see. flowing water, things may or may not be getting better, and that's what we see, so that's what we experience. There's a, I mean, we could go fog, smooth bore, and all that other stuff. The, the bottom line is you need to know your tools, and they all have a place. You can take a smooth bore and whip it in a circle and make one hell of a fog nozzle pretty quick. You can also take that smooth bore and put it off the ceiling over your head and make a hell of a lot of droplets. Right. Um, the question is, do we know where that water is going, uh, what the best way to use that water is, and it, it might not be just whip it around like a maniac. It might not be put it on the, what was it, dust? Uh, there's spray, spray and pray or whatever the Jerry Knapp and his, well, his folks were looking well, at. Well, in the old days, we used to talk about the 34-degree cone, and you got behind it. The theory was that you know, it pushed everything ahead of you and created yeah. a cool zone. And it's, you're, you're moving and air. And, and anecdotally, it felt that way. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, So we've got a lot to learn when it comes to that. If you don't have a vent opposite you, you create a higher pressure with that steam. Where's the steam going? Right. It's going from the high pressure to the low, low pressure, pressure. So, like, if you which hit a is the door behind floor, you. We've all experienced where you hit a fire above you and you feel that steam come down. It kind of descends on you like a it's like a, like the dew, but it's hot dew. It's it's going from high to low. So if you take that same thing and then you go ahead and open up a window opposite you, there are ways that you can use your nozzle to move the heat ahead of yourself. And when we talk about not pushing fire, we're not talking about not pushing heat. Heat can move, right? Gases can move, right? However, we can understand how they move and use it to our advantage. Outstanding. So, if you want to move it ahead of yourself and you have a vent opposite yourself, and you go ahead and create a cone of fog, or you start whipping your smooth bore around, you are going to create and train more air, create a higher pressure, and move things ahead of you. Exactly what you want on your interior fire attack. You also have to acknowledge. That if you do that same exact thing and you don't have that vent, it's coming back over top of you. Yeah, you're gonna and catch a ball game. And it's the high to low. Absolutely. And uh, so the things that we need to understand is if you can hold your nozzle steady, or minimize the amount of whipping or agitation when you don't have the vent opposite you, you minimize Absolutely. the amount of steam coming yeah, back over you. So it's not you don't do the same thing every time necessarily. So that's the basis of the next study is looking at the application of water onto suit onto heated materials and the subsequent results. And what happens? And what happens if there's and the correlation and the correlation study will be Dan, Doc Brown and Doc Smith looking at what's happening to our bodies. As How long does it take to get there? What are you exposed to on your way there? Awesome. Um, and that's that's exciting. And then contrary that to the the exterior knockdown. So if you can get a stream from the outside onto the seat of the fire, which if you have fire coming out of a window, you've got a ventilation limited fire. That is the seat of the fire. Right. You don't walk through that fire and have ten rooms of fire behind it unless there's air. Right. Can't can't happen. Uh, so you hit that. Now the question is, do you have a vent opposite that or not? So if that is the only opening in that structure, it's going to come back. It's going to come back out of the window, which means you don't want to open the 30 degree fog onto the window because then it's going to mix and it, it wants to come back out, but it can't. You're kind of trapping it in there. Trap. The, the vent wants to be, that low pressure wants to be a vent. It so wants we're going to get stuff out. We're going to get some great information about nozzle technique. We're going to get some great information about cooling. We're going to get some great information about. You know, we always hear that steam expands 16,000 times, or 212 degrees, and that, that's great stuff. I, I can't wait. I can't wait till we see the, the next. Um, what do you want to call it? The next. Uh, well, hopefully we get funded. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a big. Yeah, that's well, a big that, thing. that's a big thing, and that's the Fire Act grant. If there's anything in the Fire Act grant that makes absolute sense, it's spending money on research. I, I agree. I agree. Duh. But know? but the big thing here is we're. 
we're not inventing hose streams, we're not inventing the fog nozzle, we're not inventing the smooth bore, we're not inventing fire attack. No. We're measuring some things right. so you can tell what's and happening in the it, environment that you're working in. So we got some more questions coming in. But, uh, Hashtag, hashtag Bobby Chat. Right now, our next question for you, Steve, is... Ah, okay. So, Anthony Correa. And thank you, Anthony. And uh, Anthony, if you would uh, send me your email address, because you gave us your first and last name, and I like it when people identify themselves, uh, we'll send you a copy of the book of your choice from Penwell Publishing. So send me a thing, and I'll, as a matter of fact, you know what, I'll send you a, a book that I particularly like. We'll send you uh, um, um, uh, Frank Viscuso's book. Um, great, great writer, great guy. I'll send you a copy of his book. So send me, uh, go to my email, send me your address, uh, Anthony, and uh, we'll send you a copy of Frank's book. Very cool. Um, so the question from Anthony is, do you see the science, and we've kind of covered this ground, uh, conflicting with tradition. Uh, personally, I don't. I think I think our I think our tradition, if I can speak right. for a second, is experimenting and and, and learning. Right. And people always I hate it when I hear people say things. The fire service, 100 years or 200 years of of uh, uh, tradition unimpeded by progress. Right. Nothing could be further from the truth. Right. If you we have innovated on 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 instant command. We've innovated on bunker gear. We've innovated on equipment. We've innovated on on ergonomics, we've been innovated on training, we've innovated on research. We are, we have been some of the, we are some of the most creative, innovative, evolutionary people on the face of the planet because our problems continually change. Right. I mean, heck, you know, five years ago people didn't have cell, or most people didn't have cell phones. Today they're common as, you know, dirt. Sure. And we've adapted to that. You know, we've cleaned up our language in many places because we're constantly on TV. But go ahead, Steve, how do you feel about it? Well, I think the, the key is that, I mean, we, we have phenomenal things that we consider traditions. Good. Yeah, no, go ahead. Okay. I've got another question. Um, so it's, it's, it's we're, you get to a situation where things are changing around you and we innovate to, to deal with those changes. The question is, do you need to experience it in order to be able to address it. So let's use lightweight, let's use engineered eye choice as an example. We don't want to be dropping firefighters through the floors to realize that that's a problem, to then do the research to understand it's a problem. We can get to the point where we're doing enough research where we can see trends that are coming, kind of like PV systems, solar panel sure. systems. We haven't killed a firefighter touching a PV system yet, but we saw that as a potential hazard. So we studied it ahead of time. Matt Pies came out with some great work. Absolutely. We did a whole million dollar project on it, understanding what happens if you touch it, what happens if you put a hook through it, what happens if you're overhauling and you come in contact with the lines. And, and now we've got these home charging systems for cars, and there's folks coming out with some great research there. So, so how does that impact the fire service? That We're not going to have a whole bunch of home charging station fires immediately. But we're going to have them. But we're going to have them, and you don't want every department to figure out the right. hard way until we figure out how to deal with them. So if we can front load the fire service with knowledge, and that's our tradition. Absolutely. That's called service. It's, it, that is our tradition. Yep. People confuse behavior, normative behavior, with tradition. And, and norms are part of tradition and culture, but they're not tradition and culture. Tradition are, are the things that, you know, like, like uh, uh, are the fraternity, if you will, for lack of a better word, the, the brotherhood or the, and the sisterhood. Uh, that that's our tradition. Service is our tradition. Loyalty is our tradition. You know, courage, honor, those are our traditions. Uh, you know, our virtues are our traditions. Duty, you know, fairness, those are our traditions. Sure. Sympathy is probably our, our our most enduring virtue and tradition. Uh, you know, posting the colors, being reverent. You know, those are our traditions. Absolutely. But, but and, and I don't think, I, I think what you're doing enhances them. We got another question coming in, and it is? Great question from Dave Darrymple, who's going to be doing a class at FDIC. 
on, high, on, uh, on uh, extrication. Dave is one of the foremost leading experts on extrication in America today, and he uh, um, roadway roadway associates. I'm trying to I'm, I'm blanking Dave on the name of your company, but Google Dave Darrymple, amazing guy. Dave asks, what's the uh, status of the of our of science or studies today as re relates to uh, suppression agents? different wetting agents, foams, things of that nature, and new hybrid car technology and new fuel systems. What are you seeing there? Sure. Well, the, I hate to say that research is new, but in the grand scheme of things, we haven't been doing large-scale big studies where we can actually learn enough from for, for some time. I mean, I can tell you that when, when we first crossed paths and we were doing fans in, uh, in Toledo, I quickly learned that if we're going to learn anything about fans, that using them in-house is pretty complex. Let's start out using them to pressurize the space and figure them out there, and then we'll get into the complexity of the houses. Which, uh, let me point one thing out really quick on that point. At the time, we thought he was nuts, <laughs> because for us, as you know, regular firemen, not, not master degree scientists like Stephen, for us regular firefighters, we thought house fires were the simple problem, and we looked at the high rises and the mid rises as the complex problem. Right. But Stephen explained it to us. He said, "No, you know, I can control. I look at this space, and I've got a defined space, and I've got, I've got standardized, you know, um, uh, partitions." Us, and us fire assemblies. protection engineers design those buildings with a purpose, right? Exactly. They've got systems in them to protect them and to contain the fire with resistance and. Suppression. So I'm sorry. Like so so wedding agents. So so we you, you get to a point where it's like how how am I going to begin to understand the impact of blowing air into this thing when we don't fully understand the impact of opening the door? So then we got into horizontal ventilation. Now we know horizontal, so we got into vertical. Now that we know vertical, we're getting into the positive pressure. So you, you got to crawl before you can walk, right? right? So now. I think there's a lot to learn about wetting agents and foams and caps and everything else. We need to understand water first. So I think that that's where we're going with the next project is if we can understand what's happening with uh, water in terms of flow paths and pressures and different patterns and things like that, once we figure out the water to a better degree than we know now, then we can start expanding into uh, the wetting agents. and. There's been some research to date. Um, uh, UL did some stuff back before I got to UL. Uh, they've done some stuff at NIST. Dan did some stuff in the 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, and he's doing some stuff now with CAFs. Uh, but I think the bottom line is a lot, a lot of the research has been, does the foam help with knockdown? Right. And I think the answer is no. I mean, the, the foam is 99% water. The water is doing the knockdown. The research question needs to be, how well does that help keep the fire out, and how well does it improve the ability of the, the water to do its job, as opposed to focusing on the knockdown piece. Um, I mean, the folks at, at Kill the Flashover are doing some good stuff. Uh, Joe Starnes and his group. Nist and Cal Poly are doing some stuff with CAPS right now. And I don't think, uh, you know, just real quick to Dave, I, I don't think there's any danger in you. Know, I, don't, I don't think you're at any disadvantage by using foam. No, we just need to we need we to just better really understand know what's it. Because right? you got a lot of options. Right. I mean, there's there's the additives, the wedding agents, the, right. the CAPS, the Class A. Well, I, I, I remember fast water. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this stuff's not new, right? right. I mean, this, this stuff's been out there, and it's great stuff. Yeah. Dumping a thing of dove soap in your water, it's going to change the way that water behaves. Exactly. So, right. But, but I'm I'm a firm believer in we need to we need a good foundation before we can get into that, and we need to know the baseline before we can get further. So, and it's neat to work with guys like Steve because the the Steve has a really cool way, and and so does Dan of of taking really complex stuff. And, and making it understandable for us, even simple guys like me. Every now and then you'll send me a chart, and, and you got to remember, Steve loves it, the fact that he can do a hundred measurements or a thousand measurements on a single fire, and he'll send me you know, some of the results sometimes, and all those measurements are there, which to me makes it look like a plate of spaghetti. And, and so, 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 so Steve... Look at the trend, Bobby. Yeah, look at the trend. Pick the three things <laughs> that I should be paying attention to, because you get past three, I'm a simple man, and I'm lost. We have time for one more question, and, and thank you all for, for joining us here. And this will be archived, so you'll be able to see it. 
Uh, if, if you want to send this to your friends, it'll be up on YouTube. You know, do whatever you want to do with it, but we appreciate you joining us today. But our last question is, go ahead. Your authors can't call in. Okay, so Jimmy Silvernell, who is the author of Suburban Fire Tactics, said, how important was soffit protection during the attic burn tests, sure. and how, how did you address that? So, and I remember that whole yeah, issue. Yeah, because well, soffit wood is about the cheapest. Well, you hashtag Bobby chatted it out to uh, <laughs> out to everybody. Um, the the most recent set of experiments we did, we built some attics. Uh, we built some um, lightweight constructed truss attic spaces in our lab, and we looked at four different uh, tactics. We looked at opening up a small hole from below. We looked at opening up a large hole from below. We looked at water in the gable and then water in through the soffits. And uh, as you got a chance to see, I think that the the one tactic that stood out as being a little bit of a surprise was the water in the soffit uh, walking across the front of the structure, getting water where it needed to go, um, wound up being a very effective tactic. And I would I would say anecdotally. And, and I can say this because I'm not a scientist or responsible, it was the most effective tactic. Yeah, the most effective. And, and looking back at it, it shouldn't be that much of a surprise. When you look at the fire dynamics of the attic space and you look at what's actually burning, the, the underside of the sheathing of that attic space, the surface area there, that burning is the dominant fuel load in that attic space. If you can get water on that, which what we were able to do is essentially ride the water up one side, down the other side, we put water on 90% of the burning surfaces in 10 seconds. And I'll, I'll put you on the spot for a second. Why were older guys like me who started in the 70s and, and, and grew up in that era, and, well, I grew up in the 50s, but started you know, my, my firefighting career in the 70s, why was I opposed to that tactic? Because I thought I was going to do what? Well, I mean, you thought you were going to push the fire. Push the fire I, all through I, was the I was convinced that when I first heard it, I was like, you know, we're, we're, you know light the whole dang attic up. And, and, and you know, Ray McCormick, you know, uh, the urban, uh, urban firefighter legend, said that that's his favorite, that's a very effective favorite tactic out there at FDNY. When they have a, a residential, they'll pull the soffit and, and race it very effective. And, uh, and it became, I mean, we expected some of the stuff from below and stuff, of, some of the cable stuff to be a little more effective than it was. And, and ultimately, it will be effective. But if you watch where the water goes, you see real quickly why stuff works the way it does. I mean, when we came in through the gable end, no matter how you varied the angle of that stream, you were always hitting the side of a truss. And when you hit the side of the truss, the water stops and you put out about the first third of the attic space and don't touch the next attic. It was amazing. Even when we got up on plane and I was flowing directly into the gable, I could put the center out, but unless I put water on any of the surfaces, which I couldn't get to because I'm hitting the sides of the trusses, the fire came right back because we weren't wetting the majority of the surfaces. Right. So it, but it coming up from the soffit, like you said, you could hit a whole third you move down, just you know, walking right ten, along, and put the whole man, thing, the out. whole thing out. Absolutely, the whole thing out. So and, and and what you have to think about in terms of property, you know, damage or whatever. You no, know, it doesn't matter where you hit it from. You're doing the same amount of water damage. You're throwing, you know, you get, you're throwing water in there. Nobody buys wallboard in two by two pieces or sure. you know plywood comes in four by eight sheets for a reason. And so does I mean, are you still so going to have to get in, open it up, and put the fire Absolutely. out? Absolutely, you but, are. But now you don't have fire over your head. Absolutely, you know, and which we always tell people, you don't want it underneath you, and you don't want it above you. Yeah. You gain you the know? upper hand. Yeah. yeah, and I think the big the big thing there was um, that it's if you can break it down. Do we do every type of attic space? No, we didn't. No. Um, and we also didn't look at the how. I mean, we had a one-story aluminum soffit. We could get at it, pull it open, and get water in there. That's not going to be the case for every type of structure. You might not be able to do it. Uh, the other piece is you look at all these videos of as soon as the fire gets in that attic and we lose control of it, we get out, we put our ladders up or our towers up, 
and we start flowing water down through the attic space. That is getting no water where it needs to go on the, fire. On the underside of that attic that's well involved. Right. I mean, if we can get those ladders down, get those towers down, and sweep from below and get that water on that surface, I think we're going to be a lot more effective at, at uh, going home earlier. Or as the guys like to do, I mean, you gain the upper hand, you can get back inside. So get, get that upper hand, get back in there and finish the job. Yeah, so clean it, clean it up. Clean it up. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your questions. Thank you for joining us today. Um, a couple of quick notes that there's more testing going on, so there'll be plenty more coming from Steve. Steve will be presenting at FDIC a couple of times. He'll be, he's got a couple of scheduled classes, at also a big room session with uh, George Healy, John Cirillo, uh, Shane Ray, Dan Majikowski. Uh, I'll be introducing them again, as I, and as I said last year, it, it's like Woodstock. Everybody's going to claim they were there when these guys hit the stage, and it is in the big room, so it holds about four or 5,000 folks, but I would still come early because it was sold out last year. There were people in the hallways. And you couldn't get a seat, so at FDIC this year, you know, make sure you make the big room panel. You're doing a workshop, right? Do a workshop with with George and John and Dan. So and sign up for the workshop because it's it only holds 150, and I know it's pretty full. So go to FDIC.com today. Sign up for the uh, Steve's workshop, and and uh, it's a must see deal. You know, we've just been talking here for 45 minutes, but you know, Steve's got presentations and and he's got information that could go for days and. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and great presentation. So please come and please, uh, you know, support Steve. Also remember that, uh, you know, FDIC is your opportunity to uh, come to us and let us know what you'd like to see at FDIC. Come to me or Stephen or, or any of the guys and gals that are teaching. And if you want to teach, remember this is a, it's your conference. Um, there's going to be 590 instructors overall, 200 classrooms, 80 workshops, um, 21 hands-on training evolutions. So if you're a firefighter out there and you, and you want to be part of FDIC, uh, the call for presentation comes up in April, please submit. If you're looking to write about what's going on in your community, send it to me, you know, Robert H. at Penwell.com or Diane Rothschild. We're always looking for new authors and writers. But FDIC is right around the corner. We can't emphasize enough. Please don't wait to the last minute because the hotels will fill up and classes will fill up. and. Uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just a, a gathering it's the end of the year. Well, yeah, and a lot of us, the, the guys and gals, have been in the industry for a long time. It's something we plan on every year, and we just we just know. Um, somebody asked my wife the other day, uh, "When is FDIC?" And she said, "Spring." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. year round for you. Yeah, right? she just said spring. You know, yeah. sucks up your life. So we really thank you, and uh, if there's anything we can. This will be available for you on fireengineering.com. If you've got any ideas for hangouts that you'd like to see in the future or folks you'd like to have us come interview or, or come visit in your town, please send me a note. Let me know. Uh, this is your magazine. This is your website. Uh, for 137 years, we've been devoted to the interests of the fire service, and uh, we still are today. So we thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Well, and everything we do at the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute is for you guys. Um, we, we need your support. Uh, check us out on our blog, ulfirefightersafety.com. Uh, follow us on Facebook, UL Firefighter Safety, and uh, Twitter, UL underscore FSRI. And uh, look for all our stuff on fire engineering. Yeah, and thank really you to our work. friends uh, from the Alabama Fire Chiefs who have us down here in Tuscaloosa today. Um, where are you going next? Where's your... Uh, where am I going next? we got to get back in the office and start looking at all that attic data and get an online training program out so the guys can see what we learned. Well, I'll be down in Orlando over the weekend, so if you're in the Orlando area, give me a shout. Maybe we can get together. I'll be down there with our good friends from Granger. Um, then I'll be heading out to L.A. at the end of the week to see my grandkid, so don't call me there. But I'll be up in Durango the week after that with the folks from the New Mexico Fire Chiefs. So I uh, hope I can see you out there on the road. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Be careful out there, and God bless.